This is the World Organic News for the week ending the 14th of January 2019. John Moore reporting. Decarbonise the air, recarbonise the soil. This week we begin with a good news story from the blog Public News Press entitled Inmate to the Missouri State Prison Nurture a Career in Agriculture. Quote, Some inmates at the Southeast Correctional Centre in Charleston are using their time behind bars to go in more ways than one. It's a paid opportunity for low-level offenders to nurture a career in horticulture. And one of their classrooms is at a Manzi farm, a high-tech greenhouse in southeast Missouri at Sickerton. Those involved in the program are calling it a win-win because it is creating a skilled workforce and offers inmates a second chance, end quote. There is a long history of prison farms, but this one is not just the use of free labour, read slavery, but is actually paying inmates, teaching them skills and preparing them for life after incarceration. The other bonus, other than a skilled workforce and a second chance, is the yet to be fully researched effect of individuals being in touch with growing plants and soil. I know I'm much happier after I've had my hands in the soil, tossing the wonder of growing things, of creating life that feeds, and I'm sure this sort of program will produce lower recidivism and create more rounded individuals. Post number two, entitled The Blind Can See Factory Farms, from the blog The Vegan Logician, could well have been subtitled, and the vision impaired can certainly smell a factory farm. Quote, Two-thirds of farm animals are factory farm. That's nearly 50 billion animals every year. If you randomly select from a supermarket shelf, you have a two-in-one chance of picking up a factory farm product. So you can be reasonably certain that factory farm products are what you're picking up unless you have a concentrated effort to do otherwise. If it doesn't boast free-range and ethical treatment, with a massive price markup to reflect this, it's as dirty as pig swill, end quote. Now, even allowing for the possible ev- exaggeration for effect from a vegan blog, and the fact that the post only refers to the US of A, and yes, there is a world outside the lower 48 Virginia, the point still holds. Dirty as pig swill. Pig swill is, or should be, a thing of the past. Foot and mouth and other nasties are too easily transmitted through swill. The problem is we have a huge cadre of academic types and those persuaded by departments of ag and or debt to treat animals as units of input and then output in factory systems. I listened to a podcast from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation yesterday. The show's called Ideas and the episode was entitled Utopian Dinner Table. I became quite angry listening to this. The experts, in inverted commas, in the first half of the program were all rah-rah for factory farms. The work of Monsanto et al. and the need to remove more people from agriculture and increase mechanisation, irrespective of oil usage. This is why at least two-thirds of meat in the US is produced in factory farms. Similar numbers, though probably closer to 90% of chicken, apply throughout the developed world. We have a problem on a few levels. Factory farming, apart from its inhumanity and inhumaneness, is horrendously carbon-hungry. The poultry and porcine units needed, allegedly, to be held in narrow temperature ranges, carbon consumption. The livestock has to be trucked to the units, the feed has to be trucked to the units, the waste has to be trucked trucked away from the units, and finally the beasts needed to be trucked away as well. Carbon, carbon, and more carbon. This argument about needing more factory farms or going vegan, this is used by economists and urban-based environmentalists to call for veganism. Three units of feed for one unit of human feed. Why don't we just eat the feed and three times as many people would be fed? I think my head is in danger of exploding the next time I hear some sanctimonious knucklehead who has never been near a vegetable garden, let alone a paddock, make this claim. You see, an economist gets all excited about seeing landscapes of monoculture. The efficiency is in danger of giving them a thrill that should be confined to the bedroom. Monoculture is an industrial, in, in an industrial context, think Henry Ford, the division of labour, is a matter of efficiency, though it turns humans into cogs within the system and is economically, but it is economically efficient, allegedly. Raised as they evolved and were selected for an agricultural context, animals will consume things humans can't. The need for wall-to-wall, or more accurately, fence-to-fence corn crops is not there. Crops grown on soil by direct 
drill, no-till methods in conjunction with animals eating stubble and so on provides a self-sustaining system. Oil requirements are much reduced. The animals drop their manure where, they, where it is needed to, crop, to feed the crops. The crop residue feeds the stock and the soil microbiota, a regenerative system I may have mentioned in the past. Other things to remember when it comes to mixed farm is grazing on hillsides, cropping on bottom land and so on is the soil erosion benefits and the biomimicry. Plants edible to stock evolved in conjunction with the animals we now use as farm stock. Grasses benefit from being eaten down and left to regrow. Clovers release their nitrogen from their roots when eaten above ground. Ruminants evolve to eat and move on to fresh feed. Look at the undomesticated in the wild, bison, antelope and so on. Always moving, followed by birds cleaning and spreading their dung. Then the soil rests. The plants regrow and the system is ready to repeat. This process maintains landscapes and ecosystems in dynamic balance and we tamper with this at our peril. It was decided in the 1960s to remove predators from some African national parks to encourage more tourists to visit. This led to a sudden explosion in herbivores which nearly destroyed the ecosystem, and large numbers of animals starved to death as feed evaporated. We mess with ecosystems at our peril. But the economists and some ag scientists demand we eat factory farm meats, or better, in inverted commas yet, plant-based substitutes. The hillsides kept clear of fire dangers by grazing. The landscapes of outstanding natural beauty are the result in the northern hemisphere of 10,000 odd years of animal agriculture. The Sahara and semi-arid areas of North Africa are a result of too much grain growing in one place continuously. We mess with ecosystems at our own peril. And as we all know by now, there are huge carbon benefits for feeding, feeding the world with regenerative agriculture. So yes, even the blind can see the inhumane nature of factory farms. The economists, especially the neoliberal ones, are wrong about veganism as a worldwide solution to food production and carbon dioxide levels. We need to get the message out. The people on the ground are not necessarily the best communicators, but we need to collaborate with those who are. The science has been done. We now need to tell the policy makers and hold them accountable. And on that note, I'll draw this episode to a conclusion. Remember, decarbonise the air and recarbonise the soil. So with all of the above in mind and the fact that we live in the 21st century, I'm opening up applications for a regenerative agriculture mastermind group. It will be limited to 12 people. We'll meet weekly online to discuss our successes, challenges and decision-making processes. The wisdom of the crowd applied to this necessary field of endeavour. You can have a look at the intro page and click through to the application at worldorganicnews.com slash mastermind-application. There's also a link in the show notes. Of course, the podcasting checklist is still available over at mrjohnmoore.com. A transcript of this episode is available at worldorganicnews.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back next week. <laughs>